kinetics and drug disposition. So what we're going to learn is pharmacokinetics is, like I said, what the body is doing to the drug. And it really has a acronym of four things called ADME, if you've heard of that before. I think some people mentioned it in their homework, actually. So um, you've probably heard of it. Absorption, metabolism, distribution, and excretion, or some people say elimination. I think it's actually elimination by the textbook, but excretion, same thing. And we're going to learn exactly each one of those steps, how it happens. And it goes into a, huge, a ton amount of detail that we're not going to go into every single detail of, let's say, metabolism. Metabolism is a huge subject on its own. There's textbooks about metabolism. And there's still a, there's many things that we don't know about metabolism. But we'll cover the basics of all of those, all of those, uh, the ADME properties. Um, and also, we'll talk about fa factors that affect absorption, such as the bioavailability and things like that. Um, and then drug dis distribution and volume of distribution, which is the amount of drug that actually enters your tissues. Because once you take a drug, and no matter how you take it, 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 it will, some percentage of it will get to your systemic circulation. Beyond that, another percentage of it will go into your tissues. And that represents your volume of distribution throughout your tissues, throughout your, your, your extremities, you know? So, um, and that's different for, for every drug. So the main dogma, if you will, of pharmacokinetics is that a drug should be able to reach its intended site of action after administration by a convenient route, the most convenient route. So if you have a drug, let's say uh, Advil, right? Advil is great orally. It works. You would not inject Advil intravenously. You would not have a transdermal patch of Advil or intramuscular injection. That's pointless because it's not convenient. It may have more draw. Also, it would give you severe side effects because your C max would be extremely high, meaning your concentration maximum in your blood would be extremely high to begin with, and it wouldn't be time released. So a key, so that, that's all taken into account when you're making these drugs. Um, so yeah, these drugs, keep in mind what's happening is the drugs are moving throughout your body. So whether you take it in the stomach, the drug's not staying localized in the stomach. It's going through the liver, into your circulation, throughout your entire body. And in some cases, like anti-seizure medication, it affects um, the brain. So, or it has to go through the blood-brain barrier, which is a big deal. So like we said, the journey, absorption, distribution, permeation, whatever, and then metabolic, I don't know why metabolism isn't, uh, here's metabolic, metabolic inactivation and elimination. So here's the journey again. All right, so absorption, and here's the, on the right side, where you see exactly what about it. Um, so absorption, we are absorbing the drug into your body by some way of entry. And we'll learn about the different types in the next few slides. We can take it orally, we can take it intramuscularly, intravenously, which is different, transdermally, rectally even, or a um, epidural. So there, there's many different ways of, of drug administration. So once the drug enters your body, what happens? Once it's absorbed into the blood, what happens? It's distributed. The drug then reversibly leaves the bloodstream and distributes into the interstitial and intracellular fluids. So we can diffuse the blood or the drug diffuses through the blood capillaries through the cell membrane of that organ into the cell. And the amount that a drug does this is based on its polarity and also based on the blood pH. So it all, has, it all plays a role with polarity. And we'll learn about that more later. Metabolism. The drug is then, well, throughout the entire process, from absorption to distribution to elimination, the drug is being transformed by different mechanisms of metabolism, either by the liver, by the stomach, in, it could be metabolized in the tissues, it can be metabolized in any tissue, in any cell. Bacteria can metabolize drugs, such as antibiotics, right? Um, there's penicillin uh, 
there's a, there's a penicillin enzyme that cleaves penicillin. That is why some bacteria are penicillin resistant. So there are many mechanisms and chemical modifications or breakdowns, cleavings or, or lysing that can occur from metabolism. And then we talked about last class, I mentioned the cytochrome P450 system, which here's our different, they're called sites, these, these enzymes that degrade a whole bunch of different drug types. Site 2D6 is responsible for the degradation and, or metabolism of probably 70 to 80% of all drugs. The big ones, aspirin, Advil, um, most hypertensive drugs, um, most over the counters. It, it has some involvement with Site 2D6. So, but in, in total, all of these enzymes together, 90% of drugs are metabolized by the cytochrome P450 system. And then finally, we have elimination. So the drug uh, and its metabolites are eliminated by urine, bile, or feces. And here's how it, here's how it works. So absorption is the input. The drug goes in the plasma, can be distributed. The drug is an equilibrium between the plasma and the tissues. Throughout the entire time, the drug is metabolized, and then it's eliminated. It could be eliminated. Uh, uh, it could be eliminated any of these ways, but there's one that's missing, and that one is through respiratory, through the breathing. So yeah, urine, bile, tears, breast milk, saliva, sweat, or feces, or air. Any questions on this? And we'll we'll cover each one of these in a little bit more detail as we go along. Uh, what do you mean by uh, some drugs don't like to leave the blood? Can you give an example? Uh, yeah, so uh, um, aspirin. Aspirin is not good at leaving the blood compared to other drugs because it is slightly acidic. So it's polar. It's more polar than it should be. So it tends to stay in the blood and not go into the, not cross the cell membrane. But the way, and, but enough of it does that there is a therapeutic effect. So it depends on polarity. Thank you. Good question. Okay, so here are the routes of administration for the absorption. So you have um, enteral, which is through the stomach, which is your orally. Enteral or oral, same thing. Um, parenterial injection. You can have three types of those. There's an intravenous. Subcut sub yeah, subcutaneous and intramolecular. They're all slightly different, but we'll talk about the differences. Topical. So topical could be either a cream or some kind of, let's say you could apply it to the, the organ directly, but I can't give an example of that right now off the top of my head. But if you had a drug that is supposed to, let's just say, um, revive the surfactant in your alveolar sacs, right? You might have a surgery to, uh, it might be like a, a an, an accessory to surgery where after they open you up, they put, they put some of this uh, um, biocompatible paste or, or something on that tissue, on that organ to act as a mediator of some kind. You know, uh, I can't really give uh, crazy examples of that. I don't really know any, honestly, uh, but that's something we can look up. And then also transdermally. So transdermally, Think nicotine patch or any kind of patch that slow, it's a slow release. That's the whole thing for a nicotine patch. Um, and there's also, there's a, there's a ton of others that are similar. Like um, we've all heard of eardrops, eye drops, right? You have ocular, otic. Those are two those are different types of administrations. Epidural, rectal, sublingual, which is under your tongue and it just absorbs. And that's technically the same as enteral because you're swallowing it. And then um, busal which is the same as like, which is in the cheek. So busal stems from the word bucinator, which is your cheek. It's a muscle. Um, and then inhalation, right? So inhalation, same thing as, well, inhalation goes right to your lungs. So it's, I guess, different than enteral. Um, but that's for like, let's say you have an inhaler, right? Um, a tenolol or um, a salmeterol, right? Um, those are, um, those are um, anti-asthma medications. 
All right. So um, the comparison of the routes administration. So the only thing I want you to know is the difference between oral and intravenous. That's the, that's the biggest difference. Everything else, it's a spectrum of, of um, bioavailability. Well, that's the wrong word. It's a spectrum of availability to, this, to the circulatory system, right? Oral has the least, intravenous has the most. Everything else is in that spectrum. And the most important thing is just remember the ends of that spectrum. So this is why. Because if you take the oral route, you go through the esophagus, through the esophageal lining, there are enzymes there. There is mucus there. There are, um, there are uh, there's substances that will hold on to some of the drug, that will stop some of the drug, especially if you're taking a liquid or some kind of uh, powder or something, um, or, or a pill that rapidly dissolves. Then once you're done with the esophagus, you're going to the GI tract. There are tons of enzymes in your stomach. You have trypsin, you have uh, enterokinase, you have different types of kinases, enzymes, ton of them that work at low pHs. You have low pH itself, which low pH and hydrochloric acid might break down the drug. It might cause metabolism. So we don't know that. That's another, that's a huge um, reduction in active drug after you go to the GI tract. And then you go to the liver. The liver, even more reduction. You have all these cytochrome P450 enzymes attacking these, this drug. So you're thinking right now, okay, if this is the case, if you have all of these obstacles, how is a drug even making it to the circulation? But you do. You get to the pulmonary circulation, then you get to the systemic circulation. So once you go through the heart, you're going into the system. And then eventually you get to your target site of action and the drug will diffuse through the cell membrane and complete its task, whatever it is binding to whatever receptor um in cases like in cases where you have a more polar drug that doesn't like to cross the cell membrane because the cell membrane is a lipid bilayer right most likely that drug binds to an extracellular receptor so then it can act quicker and it can act uh, more uh, um, have more of an efficacy so that's oral then you compare that with intravenous Intravenous, you are direct, you are skipping esophagus, gastrointestinal, liver, and pulmonary. Well, no, not technically pulmonary, but it depends where you put it. it systemic and per, per, pulmonary happen at the same time, depending on where you inject it. So you are skipping those main three sites of metabolism and going right to the circulation. So that's a lot easier. That's a larger amount of drug that's going to reach the administration site. This may be good, but this also may be bad because it's good, obviously, you're getting more drug, but it could be bad because the intravenous route may not, I'm oh, sorry, someone was just joining. The intravenous route leads to an immediate influx of the drug. So if you want this drug, if you're taking a drug that is meant to be longer lasting or have a, have a, uh, a time release factor, you're not gonna see that with intravenous. That's why if you're ever taking, uh, if you have, have a, uh, um, intravenous in the hospital, it's constant, whether it be something simple as saline or someone who had a traumatic injury, they have a morphine drip because it, the C-max is an intense dose of morphine once it enters your bloodstream. But then after a short time, 30 minutes or so, it's gone. And then you need to take another one, and another one, another one. So that is the, the caveats with intravenous route. And intravenous also includes transdermal because once you, it's, it's closer to transdermal, transdermal falls closer to intravenous than oral because you, yes, you have to transverse the skin, but once you get to the skin and once you get past the subcutaneous layer and the muscles, you are reaching the bloodstream, but there's no esophagus, GI tract, and liver metabolism. That's the big difference between those. Entry to the circulatory system, the quickest. And it has the quickest elimination. Intramuscular is the injection version of time released. So all vaccines that you've ever gotten are intramuscular because we want a very slow elimination. We want a very slow, we want 
the vaccine enough time in the systemic circulation and in the cells to produce those antibodies or to produce, if it's an mRNA vaccine like COVID, we want enough time for that vaccine to be coded for, to be translated into a spike protein mimetic that can have an antibody generated for it. Then it's gone. We just want that spike protein mimetic to be present in our system. And that takes time. That takes a few days to, in order for that process to start happening. And that's when you see your side effects of you, you try to maybe those, uh, you have a, uh, a little fever from the vaccine or some, maybe some coughing or some tiredness or fatigue, whatever it may be. That's because the spike protein mimetic that was repl- that was uh, translated does not agree with your body at first, but then the antibodies are made and it quenches them. And then the antibodies are there for if actual COVID enters your system. So that is the difference between those. Um, intramuscular examples, you have antibiotics. If you have an antibiotic injection, it's intramuscular. Um, different kinds of uh, biologicals, like uh, immunoglobins, vaccines, toxoids, things like that, hormonal agents, testosterone. So if you, or, or if anyone does, don't don't do steroids, but those the, there's people out there that do um, anabolic steroids, HGH, and uh, testosterone. They are intramuscular injections, not because it acts on the muscle, because it's supposed to be a slow release over time. Okay, and you can see on the bottom right, we can see the difference on the top right of the actual injection, and then we can see the plasma concentration over time. Whereas intravenous, very fast, and then intramuscular, the, uh, the time release is, is slower. All right, so now we're going to talk about how exactly the drug gets through the cell. Now that the drug, we, we talked about how it, metab- how it uh, goes through the absorption process, it goes into the circulation, either intravenous, intramuscular, orally, whatever. But now, how does it make the next step into the cell? And there are four ways of transversing different types of cells. The first is through the cell membrane. And that's the easiest way, diffusion. So, oh, that's actually the second, that's actually B. Um, A is through um, aqueous channels, right? So you can have different aqueous pores that are in the cell that can allow more aqueous drugs to come in and to enter the cell. This is totally possible, and that exists. B, through diffusion through the lipid, the bilipid layer. That occurs for drugs that are nonpolar, more nonpolar than polar. So polarity plays a huge role. Generally, if a drug is nonpolar, its volume of distribution throughout the body is going to be higher, and its amount in the blood is going to be lower after a certain amount of time because all of it would have entered the tissue. The reason why it's going to be lower, it's like, oh, professor, why can't the drug that is aqueous just aqueously diffuse? Well, not every cell has the correct channels to aqueously diffuse it. But every cell has a cell membrane, and that cell membrane can be penetrated by a lipophilic drug. That's why B is the main uh, the main factor in determining the dr- amount of drug that has entered the cell. B is the major ones. A, C, and D are more minor, but they do have their place. Now, C, we have transporters and receptors. So there could be receptors or transporters that take the drug and transport the drug into the cell. And we actually have enzymes that, or we have, uh, yeah, I guess they're enzymes. We have enzymes that transport drugs out of the cell, which we'll learn about. And then D is the last one. Uh, endocytosis. So this is usually a, a reserved for larger molecules, like vitamin B12, for example, is a larger molecule, and it is it enters the cell by endocytosis, and then it is later excreted by exocytosis, or it's broken down in the cell. So these are the four main routes of drug permeation going through the cell membrane. I would say, uh, just you don't have to remember what they're called, just know how all of them work. So you can either diffuse through a pore, 
diffuse through the cell membrane, which is the most common. You can enter the cell via receptor or protein channel, or you can be endocytosis, if that's a word, endocytosized into the cell. All right, so um, here they are again. Now, passive diffusion, we're going through, well, there's two ways of passive diffusion. In, on the, in the blue is the one with the aqueous pore, right? Passive diffusion of water-soluble drugs through an aqueous pore channel, but not every cell has this. Most cells, that or most drugs that are absorbed by the cell membrane are going to be directly lipophilic and can absorb through the membrane freely. So passive diffusion of a lipid soluble drug in, dissolved in a membrane. Second one, facilitated diffusion and active transport. These require some kind of transporter or, mem or a membrane channel or a protein channel or an ionic gradient or some type of motion, whether it's energy dependent or not energy dependent like facilitated diffusion but they both require a protein or a receptor or a channel protein channel or just a, tra a drug transporter to move it so for example um you've heard of glucocorticoids right they're like um a hydrocortisone the cream like the the pain relief cream or anti-itching cream um that is a glucocorticoid, but it's a topical version. Um, also, you've probably heard of um, uh, prednisone. So prednisone is a readily given anti-inflammatory drug for if you're, let's say, after surgery, or I had, I, they gave me that when I had a tonsillitis before I got my tonsillectomy because they wanted to decrease the amount of inflammation um, and also decrease pain. Those type of drugs, these are steroidal hormone drugs. They most of the time have a drug transporter. For glucocorticoids, there's this transporter called transcortin, which actually just binds, it actually, it actually binds the glucocorticoid extracellularly. But that complex of the drug plus that receptor can transverse the cell membrane and go right into the nucleus and affect transcription. To, to, incre to decrease the amount of, um, of uh, prostaglandins, which are, which are responsible for inflammatory response. But so that's an example of that. Also, we have endocytosis. So larger molecules like vitamin B12, they're just larger and they cannot be, and they cannot enter the cell any other way. Right, so aqueous diffusion. So, um, well, we kind of talked about it already. This is just more notes, basically what I, what I talked about, but we're, it's diffusion, right? It's not, it's not an active process. And, we're, and it's mainly controlled by concentration gradients. Now, since the, sorry, since the, since it's aqueous diffusion, most likely that aqueous drug may have some partial charges because it's not gonna be polar. Or sorry, it's not gonna be nonpolar, it's going to be polar. So it's gonna have some aqueous, uh, some charges. Maybe it might have a sodium attached to it. It might be a, a, a um, hydrated salt kind of thing where it has a water attached to it and in that case we're driven by a concentration gradient from high to low so obviously the drug or whatever molecule wants to go from a high gradient or higher energy to a lower gradient or lower energy so um that's how that works and it can and it can be it can happen for molecules as large as twenty thousand to thirty thousand dalton so we're talking we're not talking antibodies but we're talking um, larger peptides, very large peptides, and, and small proteins too. And also just large molecules like, uh, oh, also another, another important thing to know, the, a, a big problem with drug discovery in general is binding to plasma proteins. So an assay they do when they do the DMPK studies is they do a, a blood, pro, a plasma protein binding assay where they have a cocktail of albumin and other plasma pro albumin the big one um where they see if any of these proteins or any of these drugs or any drug candidates bind to albumin if they do even if the drug has a picomolar affinity for this receptor and it cures every cancer ever we can't use it ever because well we can't use it at this current state at least because it binds to albumin if it binds to albumin, then it's binding to the blood. 
and it will no, it will not go into the cell at all. Now, what can we do around that? Okay, we can further develop the drug to make it less, or, or to make it lose its activity to to uh, to albumin. But albumin is pretty sticky, so a lot of compounds like to stick to albumin. So that's another big challenge in drug discovery is getting a molecule that not only limits metabolism, and if it does metabolize, it metabolizes into an active format, but also does not have any albumin or pr plasma protein binding properties. That's a killer for a drug project, or at least it's a, if they're very confident, so you, you work around it. Well, anyway, uh, any questions on what we talked about before we go into metabolism specifically? Yes, uh, sorry. Uh, my uh, first question is that which kind of uh, drugs are highly to attach to albumin? Uh, which kind of drug? Well, it really varies. Um, in general, aqueous drug or drugs that are more polar like to make more interactions with proteins. So the more polar something is, the stickier it's going to be, and the more the higher the chance of it binding to albumin. So, do you think, for example, coating can prevent this mechanism? Yes. Prevent yeah. It? So, if you can coat the drug or have a, some kind of protecting group, that's another reason why you have um, your pro drugs. So, you might have a drug that um, is inactive, but whatever protection group you have on it, like a conjugated, a conjugated like um, trifluoromethane or something, conjugate on the end of it. That does not bind to BSA, I was going to say BSA, um, that's albumin. Um, that's bovine serum albumin, which is used a lot in, in my lab. But in al it binds to, al it's a blood protein anyway. So um, the conjugate might not bind to albumin, but once it goes in the cell, there is an enzyme or there's a, there's a, 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 a metabolism process for this compound that renders it active. So that's possible too. But in general, sticky proteins or sticky uh, uh, polar molecules that are sticky. Okay, thank you. No, no problem. All right, so the, now the different phases of metabolism. There are two, I'm not going to go crazy detail on this, but there are two main reactions for drug metabolism. The first is phase one, and the second is phase two. What phase one, it's important to know what they are, not necessarily to be able to write down every reaction that, that each one does, but basically you have a drug. And if you have a good drug, so there's a scale of, this is a log P of a drug. How lipophilic is it? That's an important property because we want a drug to be an ideal drug. Well, depending on where it is in the, in the blood brain value, you want it to be more lipophilic. That's how you have a CNS active drug, extremely lipophilic. You want something though, for every other part of the body, something in the middle of polar and nonpolar, somewhere in the middle, leaning towards lipophilic. So that represents a log P value of about, of, of lower than five. And I think we cover log P in this class, in, the, in this class. Uh, yes. So the li lipid to aqueous partition coefficient. So we want that to be we want that to be below five because above five is too lipophilic, but we want it also to be above like two or three, like three to five is a good range. Of course, there are exceptions to that, of course, depending on which drug, but gen generally speaking. So for metabolism, we're taking that lipophilic drug, which is gonna be mostly a lipophilic profile, mostly nonpolar profile. And we're, and the body is, converting it to a more aqueous drug for excretion, because the goal is to get the drug to the urine or to the, or the nephron of the kidney, or to get the drug to the feces, right? For that to happen, and mostly if it's being circulated throughout your body, it's mostly going in the urine. For that to happen, it needs to be aqueous. It needs to be water soluble because, oh, guess what? Your urine is water soluble. So how does that happen? by an enzymatic process, phase one, is you are converting 
the nonpolar drug into a polar drug by metabolizing a terminal end to a positive or a negative charge or the addition of a polar group. So um, hydrolysis, um, oxidation, reduction, uh, hydroxylation, um, fluorination, things like that. There's many different ways of, of doing that. But basically converting a nonpolar drug into a more polar drug or um, nucleophilic substitution by an amine or something or, or by a, a terminal amine or a cleaving of an amine, whatever. There can be many different ways of doing it. That's phase one. Phase two is we're taking that, that more polar drug and we are conjugating it with a larger polar group. Glucoronation, acetylation, sulfonation. Those are the main three, but you don't have to memorize those. Just, just know the process of take a lipophilic drug, put it through phase one metabolism, a small change, oxidation, reduction, hydrolysis, whatever. And then that modified metabolite gets conjugated into a more water-soluble product, which then has a more likely or a higher likelihood of entering the urine and being excreted. So a good question would be, how does that happen? So here's an example of the metabolism of aspirin. Or first, is there any questions on this, on the general scheme of metabolism? So aspirin metabolism. Aspirin is acetyl salicylic acid. It has many active metabolites, salicylic acid being the main active metabolite. Than having the most effect. So let's take a look how this happens. So acetosalicylic, <laughs> acetosalicylic acid enters, you absorb it through your stomach. Phase one happens in the intestine and the blood, mostly the intestine. So you have gastrointestinal hydrolysis. So you are cleaving this group, this, uh, this, this um, ester. You're getting rid of this ester group and you're and it, it is capped as a hydroxide. This is technically making the drug more polar, but it's a change. It, it is a, it's making it, um, uh, it's, it's changing, it, right? And it's making it more polar by having the hydroxide there instead of this, uh, instead of the methyl on the, so of that salicylic acid, around 10% of it is excreted in the urine. So it's like, all right, only 10% of that has enough polarity to go into the urine. The rest of it can be absorbed, well, or some of it, some of it can also be absorbed by the tissue, or it could be bound to blood protein when it enters the circulation. Fine. Then, that, so that's, that's the, that's the, uh, the salicylic acid has therapeutic effect. That is what can happen with even phase one. So every step of this way of phase one and phase two, the drug has the option to enter the circulation or to enter the, the, the cell, that's possible, and, and have its effect. But then you also have phase two metabolism, which can happen to the drug that's still remaining. And this happens in the liver. So most of aspirin, you take an aspirin pill, you're having a large amount of it being phase one metabolized in the intestine. And also right after that, phase two happening in the liver. And this means we have a conjugation with glycine. That's, that's possible. We have oxidation, we have uh, glucoronation. So these are just three reactions that happen that can change the structure and make it more hydrophilic and less active. So salicylic acid, phenolic glucuronide, acetyl glucuronide, and genistic acid, gen gentistic, genist gentistic acid. That's a tough one to say. But yeah, so that's generally how it works for, for aspirin and a lot of drugs also follow this. And I'm gonna show you at the end of class a great resource that you guys should use for your project but also for the homework, if you're curious about certain drugs, it's called Drug Bank. 
Maybe some of you have seen it before. You will find all of this, exactly how the phase one metabolism is, the phase two metabolism is, exactly the way it works in the body, every drug all in one place. So, and also every other trait about that drug in one place, that's what I meant. So we'll, we'll talk about that at the end of the class. But is there any questions I, uh, about the metabolism, generally speaking, uh, phase one and then phase two? Okay. All right, so a uh, lipid diffusion. So, Sorry. oh yes, question. Uh, would you please uh, go to um, last? Oh yes. Uh, sorry, this phase are before entering the drug to cells or uh, they happen after entering the cell? So this is usually before. So as soon as you, so um, here, I'll take you through a uh, uh, one, I'll take you through an aspirin pill or any pill, what happens. Yeah. So you take the pill, goes down to your stomach. Phase one, intestinal metabolism happens to most of it. Let's say uh, out of 100 molecules, it's 90 of them, right? Out of those 90, they, they are salicylic acid now. They do this metabolism, this first phase metabolism of hydrolysis, they become salicylic acid. Of that 90 molecules, 10% of them goes into the urine. And at certain doses, let's say at 40 milligrams per deciliter of blood of a dose, 76% of it become, goes into the tissue. But then you still, it still leaves you with a small percentage of it. Of that small percentage of it, there is additional metabolism that happens right after in the liver. Because after, so when you get a drug into the, uh, into the stomach, some of it goes, most of it goes to the liver, or some of it goes to the liver, excuse me. And some of it can go right into the circulation. So some of it goes into the circulation, some of it goes into the liver. The liver is the main place of phase two metabolism. So a lot of things can happen, either glycine, glucoronation, oxidation, to conjugate that group and make it more polar. Does that answer your question? Thank you. Okay. And then after that, it goes into the urine. All right. Also, we have another question. Could you please repeat phase, I guess, phase one process again, please? Yeah. So phase one, basically, if you're going back, converts the non-polar drug into a polar drug, metabolizing one of the ends. Professor, right? has, I meant phase two, but it's oh, okay. Two. I got it now. Oh, yeah, sorry, I got sorry, it sorry. When, you, when you uh, explained it to her, I got it. Okay. Okay. Perfect. Yeah. Thank sorry. you. No problem. Uh, so when we're talking about a drug being, I'd say for this slide, I talked about this already, but um, the first bullet is very important. So lipid diffusion is the most important limiting factor for drug permeation. The reason is because a lot of the organs in our body and tissues are separated from everything else by lipid-based barriers. The blood-brain barrier is lipid-based. The cell membrane is lipid based. So the amount of lipophilicity of a drug is very important for drug permeation, the most important factor, as we talked about. And then we can describe that factor based on the log P or the lipid to aqueous partition coefficient. Um, and it's a factor that determines how readily the molecule moves between the aqueous and the lipid media or back because once you enter a cell, once a, once a lipophilic drug enters a cell, it might come back out. The log P tells you how frequently that occurs. That it might be, depending on the type of drug, it might be advantageous to have it stay in the cell. But if, it, if it's an equilibrium process and you don't want that drug to be in the cell all the time, you want, might want a lower log P. So it, it depends. Um, in the case of weak acids and weak bases, so this is kind of important. I'll talk about this phenomena, uh, which many drugs are not going to be uh, stronger acids or bases. They're, and if they're, by weak, I mean very weak. The ability to move from aqueous to lipid varies with pH. And why is that? Why? Because if you have a weak acid and then you have a basic um if you have a basic environment, that weak acid is going to be 
negatively charged because it's giving all of its protons to the, to the basic environment. So it's going to be negatively charged. Now that's important because if it's negatively charged, it is certainly not going to go into the, the cell membrane. It's not going to go through the cell membrane. If you have a slightly basic drug and an acidic environment, that basic drug will take on another, will be uh, protonated. Once that drug is protonated, it'll then have a charge because if it's a weak base, let's say it has an amine, it will then be NH3 plus on the terminal end, and that will create a drug that is highly polar and basically aqueous and will not go through the cell membrane. Okay, so that's what we mean by lipid diffusion. And the henderson hasselbeck equation can be used. We're not going to cover this in detail, um, but basically we can tell the pH of, or we can tell the, uh, well, we can tell the pH of a drug, uh, sorry, the pKa of a drug based on the amount protonated or unprotonated, or we can tell it based on the pKa of the drug and the pH of the solution or of the uh, blood plasma. The relationship and the ratio of protonated to unprotonated drug and see how much of it is um ion or how much of it is ionized and how much of it isn't that will tell us the amount of drug that can be in the urine so if it's let's say if it's an acid and it is protonated is low pka that means the drug will probably get into the urine or will not get into the urine as much because we need it to be charged to get into the urine, we want to be water soluble, as I said before. But we're not going to have to use this equation in this class, so don't worry about that. Okay, uh, so yeah, here's just a representation. So if you have pH right from zero to fourteen, the pKa of your drug determines its charge. If you have a weak a weak acid or weak base drug, it determines its charge based on the pH of the blood. So if your pH is lower than your pKa, that means your, your, um, your drug is going to be protonated because the, the acidic medium is going to give its hydrogen to your drug. So if it's an acidic drug, you'll have your higher predominant forms of HA, which is your H plus your drug, uh, plus your acidic drug. And then, or if it's a base, you'll have BH plus, which will be like your NH3 plus. And then on the other hand, if your pH is greater than your pKa, meaning your drug is in a basic or more basic medium, your drug will be deprotonated, meaning it will try to donate protons to the basic environment. Making an a, making an an ionized a weak acid drug or a neutral weak basic drug. So I'm not going to really. I may ask one question on that, but um, but not really number. Not you don't really have to focus on the numbers. All right. So um, special carriers. We kind of talked about this already. So transcortin and glucocorticoid. So basically a special carrier, which is a, a protein or some kind of, or it's usually a protein, uh, some kind of a, a protein or even a peptide that can transport a drug into the cell membrane by diffusing it to help it get to wherever it needs to go. But in, in transcortin's case with glucocorticoids, it, get, it helps it go through the nuclear pore complex as well. It gets into the cell membrane, goes into the nuclear pore complex, which it then affects gene transcription and a gene expression of, um, of a prostaglandins. All right, so there is this important class of proteins and, and transporters that affect metabolism in the cell, intracellular metabolism. And they're called ABCs, or ATP binding cassette family. The only one of these that we're gonna cut, so basically what they do, before I talk about the important one, is they 
transport drugs out of the cell. That's what they do. They transport drugs out of the cell. There is P glycoprotein and multi-drug resistance type 1 MDR1 transport. So they can transport, and it's an enzyme. They, they basically, the substrate of the enzyme is the drug, either the metabolite or the drug itself. And once the substrate binds to the intracellular part of the receptor enzyme, it then goes extracellular and it excretes it outward. And this is true for many different drugs, for uh, chemotherapeutics or, or really anything, any type of drug. So these drugs also, the reason why they're called ATP binding is because they need ATP to function. And some of them don't. There's others that, um, well, the, the ATP ones do, but there's other type of transporters that use ion gradients, like uh, different types of uh, membrane um, voltage or voltage gated ion channels that can release drugs. That's possible too. Um, but the main one is P glycoprotein. So for what you have to know, know that there are a family of proteins or, or really, I mean, they're enzymes, same thing, whatever. Proteins are, enzymes are a type of protein, but an enzyme has a substrate. These have substrates, so it's an enzyme. They're called, they're ATP dependent. They're called ATP binding cassette proteins, cassette enzymes. And they are responsible for excreting cell, excreting drugs from the cell. That's it. So you have to know. The main one is P glycoprotein. And know what, know what it is. Know that P glycoprotein is the main, the main one. And there are many different ways that medications can modulate P glycoprotein. This is why it's important. Because one, not only does it transport a lot of drugs out of the cell, but it could also be inhibited by several drugs or induced by other drugs. And we can have a, a whole ton of drug-drug interactions with this. So for example, if you have um, quinidine, quinidine is a P glycoprotein substrate, but you're also taking aspirin, which is a P glycoprotein inducer. Think about that. You are taking, so by substrate, we mean it goes through, it goes through P glycoprotein and enters the extracellular. We want a drug when it's active to be in the cell for a long period of time, but not too long. It's a fine balance. So if we have quinidine, it enters a cell and it's a substrate of P glycoprotein. But if you're also taking aspirin, what is going to happen? I'm asking you guys this. What is going to happen to your effect of quinidine if you're taking uh, something else that is a P glycoprotein inducer on top of a substrate for quinidine? Um, okay, so uh, if you take quinidine, it will enter the cell. And then it will, if you're taking aspirin, which induces P glycoprotein to work faster, it's gonna, as soon as it enters the cell, it's gonna leave the cell. So you're not gonna have much of an effect of quinidine. It's gonna be a quick in, quick out. So the therapeutic effect might be very small. So that's what we're talking about. When we say drug interaction, it may not always be negative. It may not always be, oh, if we take these two drugs together, you're gonna die. That's not the only drug interactions there are, or you're gonna get, uh, a severe illness and, and, and have a heart attack, right? It might just be, if you take these two drugs together, one of them might not work because of this. Or because of one of them uses a different site or uses the same site as another one. And the metabolism of one of them will be decreased. Professor, one question. Yes. So, for example, what is the name of this effect? Like, if they act... Uh, together, like towards the same value, it's going to be synergic. But what is this? Is it an antagonist effect or? Uh, yeah, this is called a, we call it a negative drug interaction. Negative drug interaction. Okay. Yeah. So, as, um, 
synergic drugs, uh, they would work together for the same purpose um, uh, or work together. One of them, let's say, well, here's an idea of synergic. If you take quinidine, which is a substrate, but you want to keep quinidine in the cell for longer, you can also take one of these ones in the middle, which is an inhibitor. And I, look, I, I do see that quinidine is also an inhibitor. Ignore that. Let's say you take propanolol, which is an inhibitor. And you take quinidine. Propanolol will bind to P glycoprotein and inhibit it, while quinidine enters a cell and has a larger therapeutic effect at certain doses. So that's what we mean by synergistic. That, that's one, or not what we mean, that's one way of synergistic effect by two drugs. But on the contrary, if your doctor doesn't know that or doesn't prescribe the correct amount of quinidine or prescribes a normal dose of quinidine, you might see toxicities and you might see side effects and you might see overdosing because the quinidine has no longer a route to be metabolized because it's being inhibited by another drug, propanolol. So that's what we have to think about with drug interactions is how is that a drug going to affect the metabolism of the other one? And that's a really difficult science. That's why the, the people that, that do this or the, in this level of drug discovery, figuring out the, the pharmacokinetic properties are just as important, if not more important than the pharmacodynamic properties. Because look, I mean, I'm more of a pharma than pharmaco, pharma, yeah, pharmacodynamic person because of all the exploratory biology I do. And to me, it's, it's more easy. It's, it's easier to make a, an inhibitor of something than to make sure that inhibitor is safe in the body and doesn't have any drug interactions or off target binding in the human body. That is so difficult to test for. And that's why there's a hundreds of experiments you can do to rule out certain things. So. You ultimately don't know until you put it into in vivo models and then into people. So anyway, those are what we, that's what we mean by drug interactions. And that's what we mean by- Quick question, you know, uh, yes. Professor. So in case you, uh, maybe if we encounter such a question and you just give a straightforward answer like uh, drug, that the answer is drug interaction, do you want, are you gonna give credit for that or do you want specific uh, explanation that as you just said uh, just indicated now so it the, so in in the question where i give regarding this material it will be kind of a case study uh kind of like oh if you take this drug which is a substrate of p glycoprotein and then this drug which is an inducer of p glycoprotein what do you expect the activity to be like for for the substrate so i will give kind of like an open ended kind of question and you'll you'll have to explain why and it'll be partial credit will be given for that one also. So okay. that's it won't be clear cut as like ABC. Okay. So because I know that basically there's the the interaction between both of them is is a drug interaction. So that was why I stated drug interaction. Right, right. It is a drug interaction, but um, yeah. of that. Okay. Okay. All right. Thanks. Okay. No problem. All right, so um, this is vitamin B12 on the top right with um, endocytosis. So we kind of talked about that. So there, it's the reason why it has to be it has to enter the cell through uh, endocytosis is because it is too large, and there aren't any membrane proteins that bind to it and kind of internalize it. But it has to be a vesicle has to be created. So yeah, um, not really much. I'm not gonna really go too much detail about that. Um, just know that's a that's a type of of uh, enter a, a one method of entering the cell. Okay, so another concept we're gonna learn about real quick is the concept of drug trapping, which is done. It's interesting. I'm not gonna test you on it, but it's interesting. So all drugs are we didn't learn about the kidneys yet, but are filtered through the glomerulus, which is part of the kidney like nephron, if a drug is lipid soluble, it goes down the renal tubule. Some in the renal tubule, which 
we'll talk about. Washi, you want? We'll just go here. Here, here's the renal tubule. Here's the nephron. Here's the, the, the kidney. All right. So if you have a drug that is in the blood or the interstitial fluid that, that's separated from the kidney, this drug is trapped in the interstitial fluid if it's aqueous or if it hasn't if it's ionized so if it's not ionized i know i know this is being kind of complicated but we'll, we'll get around to it so if it's not ionized like it is right here the uh, rnh2 this is not ionized it is better it is uh it's much more capable of transversing the nephron and getting into the kidneys once it's in the kidneys it's not water soluble, so it can't be excreted yet, but it could be modified by the pH. See the urine pH is six. It will be instantly protonated and ionized. Therefore, it won't be allowed to go back through the nephron into the interstitial fluid or into the body cavity, and instead will we'll, um, we'll be excreted as urine. This is called drug trapping, and you can actually do it. Now, I'm not a physician, so I don't, I don't know exactly how you would treat a patient to drug, track their drugs, but it usually dialysis. So what you can do is dialyze their blood and lower the pH ever slightly or raise the pH ever slightly in order to have an effect where you can either trap the drug or you could dialyze your urine in the kidney also. But you can change the pH of the blood in the kidney to reduce toxicities of drugs. So this system, you know, I may ask a question on that. Um, but, uh, but this will be covered again in the, in the study guide. But let's just hear me out of how this works. So think about it. You're changing the pH of both the blood and the urine in such a way where you want to take the drug that is too much of it is in the blood. It's a, it's a toxicity event. It's an overdosing, right? Somebody overdoses on aspirin or overdoses on um, a painkiller, overdoses on, on an opiate, whatever. And that opiate happens to be a weak base or a weak acid. That is when you can use drug trapping. What we're trying to do is we're trying to take the drug in, a, in, a, in the non-ionized form, AKA the more lipophilic form, from the blood, move it to the urine. The urine pH will be lower than the pKa of that drug, which will ionize it or, or higher, depending on what type of drug it is, if it's a weak base or weak acid. And it will convert that drug into an ionic component or ionic counterpart. When it's ionic, it can no longer enter the blood and it will have to be excreted and it will be trapped in the urine. That's the goal, trapping it in the urine, getting it from the blood, moving it. Maybe we have to change the blood pH in order to move it easier. Maybe it's already ionized like it is in the, the bottom left. Maybe it's ionized in the blood. So maybe we need to, in this case, we would raise the pH to 7.6. If we raise the pH to 7.6, maybe some of these H's go, to the, get, get a, go into the blood. And then we have an unionized form, which can then diffuse quicker into the nephron. This will lower the effective concentration of the drug in the system and lower the toxicity of that. So that's what we mean. That's what drug trapping is. So I know that may be a difficult concept, but is there any questions on that right now? Okay. Well, we have the video after it comes out. You can rewatch this part. I recommend rewatching this part. The kind of questions I will give you on an exam is I will say, we will have drug A, it is a base. Drug B, or no, not drug B. You have drug A, it's a base. All right, here we go. Here, here, I'll give you an example. Um, all right, so drug A, let's say it's an acid. Okay, the pKa of the drug A equals, uh, I don't know, Five point, no, six point 
6.8. Okay. It is in the blood, right? There's a toxicity event. Toxicity event. We want to excrete drug A quickly. That's not quickly. Quickly. How would we use drug traffic? Okay. So what you would do is the drug A is in the blood. The pH of the blood is 7.4. That means that's good. No, that's not good. Sorry, it's not good. Because what's going to happen is because the pKa of the drug is lower than the pH, the drug will stay in its... Actually, no, that is good. Yes, it is good. It will stay in its... I picked a bad pKa. Um, I'm going to do a pKa of 7.5. How's that? 7.5. Yeah, 7.5. Okay, sorry. Um, drug A, well, then it wouldn't... Okay, let's just say it's an acid anyway. Is it a P pKa of 7.5? Sure. Um, let's say, so in the blood, pH is 7.4. So the drug will be at physiological pH of 7.4. The drug will be in its ionized state. Drug initially in ionized state. And that's because the pH is lower. So that means the, most of the hydrogens are in the pH or in the, or in the solution or in the blood. And wait, it's not going to work the way I think it is. So wait, if pKa is 10.5, that means the solution, I think I was right the first time with what I'm trying to get across. I'm sorry. Cut. So if the pKa is 6.8, that means the that means the drug is going, to, is going to be, oh, okay, yes, 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 okay, I'm right, I'm right, I was right, I was right at first, okay, that was a test, nobody corrected me, but okay, let's, let's pay attention to this, so drug A is acidic, pKa is 6.8, when it's in the blood at 7.4, the drug will give its hydrogens to the solution, because it has a lower, it has most of the hydrogens, because it is a acid, and it has a lower pKa than the pH, Therefore, the drug will be ionized. It'll be O minus on the end of it. It'll be a carboxylic acid with O minus at the end. Like that. Okay. So this means that the drug cannot go across the nephron because it is ionized and it cannot cross the lipid membrane. We need to change the blood pH in order to move it over. So what we can do is change blood pH to 6.75. If we do that, now the pH is lower than the pKa of the drug, which means all of the H's from the, or, or the, uh, the hydrogens from the, or the increased hydrogen concentration of the blood will reprotonate. It will reprotonate the drug. Meaning the drug is now not ionized. Then the drug will be able to move to the blood or to the urine, sorry, it will cross the nephron and enter the urine. After it enters the urine, it is still not ionized. It can go back and forth. It's an equilibrium, right? But the urine pH is 6. So what we need to do is turn the drug back to its ionized form so it is trapped in the urine. This means that the urine, or change urine pH to 6.9. If we change the urine pH to 6.9 above the pKa of the drug, the drug will be reionized and trapped in the urine. And so then it will be excreted as, as waste. Okay, that was a lot. Are there any questions on that? And if you didn't understand what I'm saying, 
that's fine. What I can do is I'll, 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 I'll like put, put a link for a video for drug trapping, but that's generally how it works. Any questions? How do you change the blood pH to six? Decrease oh. the blood pH? Yeah, so it usually would be by dialysis. So you can dialyze your blood, or they can do that in the hospital, and they can change the pH. Now, the, I, it, it probably wouldn't be 6.8. It's probably very fine-tuned more than that. Like, the, the, the pK of the drug would be 7.2, and you'd have to change the pH to 7.1. You know, 6.8 is a bit too low. You would, you would probably go through um, um, acidosis. So that would be too low, but it would be a small change. Good question. All right, so let's continue. Um, we'll talk about bioavailability next. So this is an important part of pharmacokinetics because what bioavailability is, is the fraction of the unchanged drug that reaches the circulation, right? The fraction of it. And it relies on two things when we're talking about oral activity. So uh, who can answer me this? This would probably this is an easier question. What is, or at least I hope it is, what are the two mechanisms of metabolism or ways you can lose a drug from an oral administration to get to the systemic circulation? What are the two ways that you can lose some of your drug or get it metabolized? It's getting uh, broken down by enzyme during digestion. Good. And what's the other one? Um, just... What was that? Uh, acid. Mm, yeah, know. acids in the, the acid's going to occur in the stomach. But yeah. What happens right after the stomach? The, uh, it gets metabolized by the liver. Exactly. Good. Good job. So liver, so stomach and liver are the main two reduction, uh, I was about to say reduction agents, that's not the correct word, but um, they reduce the effective dose of a drug that's orally administered. Stomach, liver. So the way we figure out oral availability or bioavailability, and the bioavailability is how much of the drug gets to the systemic circulation. For it, for reference, the, the comparison we're making is to an intravenous dose. If we have an intravenous dose, the bioavailability is assumed to be equal to 100, equal to unity. What? I don't know what that means. I didn't write that. Okay, equal to 100. That's because you're injecting it. It's all right there in your blood. It's, it bypasses the stomach and the liver. For drug administering orally, bioavailability may, less, may be less than 100% for two main reasons. One, incomplete extent of absorption across the gut wall and first pass metabolism by the liver. So like you said, with two, extent of absorption, that's a factor by the gut and then that's a factor controlled by the gut and then first pass elimination by the liver. So bioavailability through oral is gut wall absorption and liver metabolism. That's literally it. That's what, that, that's what controls it. So we're going to learn about the formulas of that very quickly. Um, so area under the curve analysis. So an area under the curve analysis represents the bioavailability for a drug. We can compare it. We can compare the uh, oral administration and concentration over time versus the intravenous. So if you take an intra, look at the right, um, you take an intravenous administration, which is the top red line, you inject it 100% immediately, then you start to have excretion, metabolism by the cells, metabolism by enzymes, maybe some plasma binding, it'll go to, the, it'll go to the nephron, whatever, your drug will eventually be eliminated. If you have an oral dose, the area under the curve is much less because much less is reaching the circulation. And it's in a more time, uh, time controlled manner, a uh, time released manner, where at first it's zero, then it generally increases to what we call a C max, and then it starts to decrease as the drug becomes eliminated. So that is how 
we compare bioavailability. So the one of the one of the formulas for bioavailability is the area under the curve of the oral divided by the area under the curve of the intravenous, which is considered 100 percent times 100. So it's the percent bioavailability. That is how you figure it out. That's one way to do it, at least. Um, any questions there? That's something I may expect you to do on a multiple choice question. So the extent of absorption, this has to do with a right gut. All right. So after oral administration, a drug may be incompletely absorbed, meaning like, for example, uh, digoxin, only 70% of the dose reaches the circulation. And this is mainly due to lack of absorption by the gut. So absorption by the gut into the liver, extent of that happening, if that happens 70%, that's good. That means only 30% of the drug is not getting past that. So you have drugs that are either too hydrophilic or, hydro, or hydrophobic that can be easily absorbed, or sorry, uh, they're too hydro, um, sorry, uh, too lipophilic, which it can be absorbed easily. If it's too hydrophilic, it won't really get absorbed and may have a low bioavailability. So that's one thing to talk, that's one thing to mention. And then we have the second factor. So that's the first factor. So extent of absorption, and it's a percentage. So it's the percent that is absorbed of the drug through the stomach is that percent. I'll write that down actually. It's an important definition. So percent of drug absorbed through stomach wall. So we want that to be high for a drug. Then we have the liver. So the liver goes through first pass metabolism by our site, our P450, et cetera. Oh, sorry, you guys are, don't know what I'm talking about, but it was a private message from one of your classmates because you have two devices. Okay, no problem, sorry, cut. All right. Um, Propanol, yeah, so in an IV dose, super effective, all you need is one milligram. In a pill, 40 milligrams, because those extra 39 milligrams, first of all, it's more time release. So what you have is you have a lot of first pass elimination, meaning the first pass metabolism for phase one metabolism eliminates a lot of the drug and metabolizes it. So it's greatly reducing the amount that is going into the systemic circulation. That's what we mean by first pass elimination. So we have these two factors, extent of absorption, which is a percent, and first pass elimination, which is not, an, which is not a percent. Well, it is a percent, technically. So here's how we figure it out. So, the, so here's the, the It's called the extraction ratio. First pass elimination is called extraction ratio. So, write that down. First pass elimination equals extraction ratio, which equals the clear. We didn't learn about clearance yet, but basically, it's a it's a uh, liter value. It's the the clearance of the amount of drug that that did that does enter out of or the amount of drug that can clear from the liver over Q, which is the hepatic blood flow, which is the normal blood flow. So the first pass elimination is the ratio of those two. Now, to determine bioavailability of a drug total, we have to factor in the extent of absorption, which is the gut, and the extraction ratio, which is the liver. So how do we do that? By this formula, big F, which is the systemic bioavailability of a drug, equals little f, which is the percent, percent extent of absorption. We want something to absorb more. 
So if our extent of absorption is 90%, that's 0.9, so little f. Times 1 minus the extraction ratio. The reason is because we don't want things to extract. The extraction ratio, if, if the extraction ratio is high, that's bad. That means our liver is metabolizing most of the drug and not much of it is going to our systemic circulation. So, for example, uh, on the bottom, morphine, we have an example right here. So drugs such as morphine are almost completely absorbed so that loss of the, in the gut is negligible. So big F is equal to, it's not even equal to zero because you can't say that, it's equal to nothing. Well, it's 100%. So, sorry, one. It's the uh, extent of absorption is equal to one. However, hepatic extraction is 60 liters per hour per 70 kilograms for or 0.67. Or, sorry, divided by hepatic blood flow. So, it's 60 divided by 90 or 0.67. So, that means 67% of the drug is extracted. Extraction ratio, right? 60% of the drug, 67% is extracted during your first pass metabolism. Meaning one minus 67% or 33% is left over that is not metabolized by the liver. And factoring in the extent of absorption, which is 100%, you have 100 or one times 0.33, which is 0.33 or 33%. So that is how you figure out bioavailability of a drug. So does that make sense? Are there any questions about that? No? Okay. All right, so we kind of talked about that already. Volume of distribution. So the volume of distribution represents the relative volume of drug displacement throughout the body and the amount of drug binding to tissues, which is good. We want drugs to go into tissues. And it also represents the decrease in plasma concentration. So something, I, something another way to think about this area under the curve, the y-axis is plasma concentration. As plasma concentration decreases, the drug I mentioned, elimination and metabolism, it's not only being metabolized, it is actually entering the tissues and working. So our blood, our, our, our drug plasma concentration, we don't want it to be high all the time. We want it to get lower because you are, the drug is moving from the blood to the tissue to have its therapeutic effect. So that's an important thing to think about that I, I did leave out. So our volume of distribution is a number that represents this distribution throughout the tissues. So I'll cut to the chase. Normally, if we have a blood volume that is five liters, that's considered it's 50-50 in the blood and in the tissues. A higher VD, a higher volume of distribution, equals a higher distribution in tissues. So if we have, a, and here's, here's why, here's the way it's calculated. So the amount of drug in the body divided by our concentration of the plasma of the drug, or of the drug in the plasma at time zero. So if you have a dose of drug and at time zero, the plasma concentration is low. That's good. That's better than it being high. Because that means where is the drug? It is in the tissue. So we want this to be higher for high tissue, absor tissue absorption and for a higher effect of the drug. So drugs that don't leave that, that don't leave the plasma have a smaller VD, right? So smaller volume distribution means 
that the C0, the concentration of the drug in the plasma is higher, meaning a smaller VD. Water soluble drugs or protein bound drugs that don't leave the, the, the albumin, those tend to have smaller VDs, which isn't a bad thing. It's all drug dependent. So every drug is designed from years of research and intense research, uh, intense work by many people, by hundreds of people, as we learned a few weeks ago. So it's all kind of optimized, but in general, a drug that has a small VD, you generally want to give a higher dose to, because you know, most of that drug is staying in the plasma and not getting into the tissues. So drugs which prefer to bind more into tissues or are more lipophilic leave the blood and have a higher VD and they slowly release back into the blood. So here's a, here's a, a comparison of, of VDs. So drug A has a dose of 500 milligrams. So here's what, a, kind of a case study that I would give you. A drug has a dose of 500 milligrams. It has a blood concentration initially of one milligram per liter. So the amount of drug divided by the concentration is 500. 500 divided by one is 500. And that would be milligrams divided by milligrams divided by liters, which is gonna be, if you flip it over, it'd be, it'd be liters. So 500 liters. This means, so what does this mean? You can't have a, a blood volume of 500 liters. That's ridiculous. You only have a blood, you only have like five liters of blood. Right? What does that mean about the drug? If your volume of distribution is 500 liters, does it like the tissue or does it like the blood? Uh, who, who wants to answer that? Anybody? 500 liter volume of VD. Does it like the blood? Does it like the tissue? Tissue. Nice job, Kyle. Good. It likes, it, it's probably lipo, and also you could assume it's probably lipophilic. It probably likes, it probably has a nonpolar structure or a more nonpolar structure than another drug. So once we get into like later on, maybe a midterm question might be, if I give you a struct, give you two structures, right? Two drug structures, which one of these has a higher VD? You have to think, you have to make a couple of conclusions. And this is why, so we're grad, we're in a graduate class. This is the kind of questions that I would, I would kind of, I would put some of them would be more straightforward. Some of them will be like this. If I give you two structures and let's say a and B, a is more lipophilic. You'd have to make that decision and be like, okay, for, in order to figure out VD, higher VD means more lipophilic. So I'm looking for the one that's more nonpolar. I find the one that's more nonpolar. That's my answer. So you have to draw conclusions rather than just memorizing what things are. Now, I like those questions better. Then uh, drug B on this, in this case, right? So drug B has a dose of, of, again, 500 milligrams. Its blood concentration is 50 mg per mil, 50 mg per liter, 50 mg per mil, that's ridiculous. 50 mg per liter. Its VD is 500 divided by 50, which is 10. 10 liters. The, it's somewhat in the tissues. It's more in the tissues than it is the blood, but it's still in the blood, a good amount compared to drug A. So that's all I'm talking about is com we're comparing two drugs. And like I said, a VD over five means the drug is entering the tissues in a substantial amount because our blood volume is five, five liters. So if it's a VD of 10, that means it's, it's staying somewhat in the blood, but it's also getting to the tissues enough, enough to be uh, effective. So here's another example. Yeah, okay, this is right. Cause I remember that when I first saw this slide, I, I got it from an old professor at Keene University. The slide was wrong at first, like there was a typo. It said more drug on the left than less on the right. It was flipped, but I was gonna make sure it wasn't flipped. Okay, so uh, drug A is again, the VD of 500. So that means less of the drug will be excreted in the urine. Most of it is gonna be in the tissues. 
until we do something about it. Let's say we trap the drug in the in the in the urine, or we activate P glycoprotein to get it out of the cells if we don't want it anymore. If there's a if there's a uh, effect, if there's a um, a toxicity effect, and then drug B, our VD is lower, meaning more of the drug is excreted in the urine, more of it is in the blood to begin with. So that's just an example there. So here's a good question. Before this is the last thing we'll do. Um, so salicylates and digoxin. So salicylates like aspirin to pain relief, blood thinners reduce blood pressure. Uh, also could be used topically for infections, things like that. Um, also, uh, digoxin it increases cardiac efficiency and cardiac output. They both have a narrow margin of safety, right? Aspirin, because it's a blood thinner. So if you take too much blood thinner, um, your blood pressure will decrease and um, you can uh, be really pr pr uh, prone to bleeding and have some other negative side effects. And also have to be lightheaded and stuff like that. Um, Salicylates have lower volume of distribution. And remember, I mentioned before that aspirin is a weak acid. And that is exactly why it has a lower volume of distribution, because it has an acidic component to it and is more polar, meaning it's not going to diffuse through the cell membrane as easy as a digoxin will. So the question is, a toxicity of which medication will be better treated by hemodialysis? So hemodialysis means dialyzing out the blood with fresh blood or with uh, blood without drug in it. So hemodialysis is a way of treating overdosing and blood toxicities because your idea is that you're filtering out the bad blood for blood that does not have the drug. So which one would be more effective in hemodialysis treatment or which overdose would? Salicylate or anybody? Salicylate? Yes, and why is that? Because it tends to uh, stay more in blood. And... Exactly, good. It has a lower VD, and good job, Kyle. Lower VD, meaning it's going to be um, absorbed by the tissues less, and it's going to be present in the blood more. So that means if more of it's in the blood, it can filter out quicker. And then you throw some of that P4, or, or you throw some of that uh, P glycoprotein inducers in there, which are going to excrete more of it out into the blood, which will then filter it out even faster. So using these kind of mechanisms, and I talked about several of them today, we can treat drug toxicities by in taking advantage of the pharmacokinetic properties of the drugs by changing the pH, filtering out, um, by increasing metabolism. If we want a drug to act for longer, we can decrease it metabolism. We can have a drug effect that if we have a drug that, oh, we can't get around cytochrome P450. We can't get around it. It just metabolizes all the drug. The uh, extraction ratio is, is, uh, is 100%. What can we do? We can take that cytochrome P450 enzyme and we can inhibit it. Or we can treat it with another drug, or treat it in a combinatorial therapy. And with another drug that also uses a cytochrome P450 in order to distract the P450 from metabolizing the main drug that we want. So more of it will get through. There's a lot of options. So a lot of these I will give to you in open-ended questions. And the homework has some of those, or one of those, or a few. So I'll uh, look at the homework first. So uh, let's see, were the four routes of administration quickest and the slowest? Um, I might change this. What are the four main routes? I guess main route, yeah, we'll do main route, that's good. Um, summarize the route of oral drug administration to the target. What are the two main factors, we've talked about that. Atenolol is a beta blocker using treating hypertension. It is transported by plea glycoprotein. Is P glycoprotein explain three ways that you can treat the toxicity. And then you have two drugs, A and B, were developed for the management of non small cell lung cancer. Unfortunately, they both carry high level of toxicity, and the decision was made to proceed with only one of them. With 
the one that could be better eliminated through the hemodialysis in case of toxicity. Preclinical studies in mice showed that a peak plasma concentration after intravenous injection is 20 milligrams of the drug A and 2.5 of drug B uh, were were uh, 17.5 microgram per mil and 1.2 milligram per mil, respectively. Which medication would you recommend with proceeding with? So these are all good questions for homework. Um, and the assignment is listed. Now, um, any questions on volume distribution or metabolism or anything right now?